Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is episode 200 and I think 30 of Dadvice TV Live. Wow, lots of great information here to help you understand kidney diseases. I like to say, kick kidney disease to the curb. Now, if you're new, welcome. It is great to have you here. Make sure hit that subscribe button. And my name is James. I'm a kidney warrior. I was diagnosed with stage five, told, hey, your future is dialysis. Well, instead, I focused on learning about kidney disease, being more active, eating right, working with my doctors, getting that blood pressure under control. And as I started to live a healthy, healthy lifestyle, my lab started to improve. Now, some people may think, oh, you fixed your kidneys. No, 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 no. We're going to talk more about that tonight. My kidneys are still shot. They're still scarred. They're still shriveled. But by being healthy, I was able to get all my symptoms under control, get my energy back, and live life to its fullest. Now, tonight, my co-host is going to talk about how can you cure kidney disease. Let's go ahead and welcome him. He is the author of my favorite kidney book, the one book that if everyone with kidney disease was given when they were diagnosed, they would feel so much better because it's so easy to read and understand and know what matters. That book, of course, is Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. And you can go straight to go.dadvicetv.com slash book, which will take you to Amazon where you can get a copy of it for yourself if you'd like, or run down to your local mom and pop bookstore. Show them some love, especially during these times of COVID, and ask them to order you a copy of it. They'd appreciate the business, and it's great to give back to the community. But my co-host, the author, of Learn the Facts About Kitty Disease is none other than Dr. Stephen Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. I go by Dr. Rowe, which is a nickname they gave me uh, in my dialysis unit by one of my favorite uh, dialysis technicians. A lot of my patients had trouble with it, so they call me Dr. Rowe, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm always happy to be with James. I find James to be such a positive, wonderful spokesperson for folks, person for people with kidney disease. I'm a retired kidney specialist who took care of kidney patients over 40 years. I started a kidney program in Columbia, South Carolina. I started the dialysis unit. I've, I've extensively researched kidney issues. Uh, lots of my research has gotten recognized. I have over 100 publications. I've done a lot of work on various pharmaceuticals that could be used for patients with kidney disease. So I have a pretty wide range of, of experience and knowledge. And one of my most important contributions in the field has been related to the issue of when to start dialysis. And I will, I will before we get into today's cure topic, air quotes, and you'll hear that in a minute, I want to just be sure that any of you who are facing dialysis in the near term, in the next year or two, or the next few months, if your doctor has brought that up, please take a look at my book. Look at the section of my book about making decisions about going on dialysis or getting a transplant. And also my book will tell you the options you have. And it will more importantly tell you when you do not really need to start dialysis. And for many of you, this book may save you from the discomfort of surgeries and preparation for dialysis and potentially months or years of unnecessary dialysis. So I'll start with that. And, um, and let's get into our topic of the cure of kidney disease. James, you ready? Oh boy, I am ready for it, doc. <laughs> and, we have a I great audience and I knew this topic would get a lot of people excited. Well, I know uh, James is going to get excited because I've already told him I'm going to quiz him a bunch because James <laughs> I think, knows a lot of what I'm going to say tonight. 
and we'll see just how well he does on the quiz. And remember, uh, I'm keeping track of all the questions people are typing. So if I get one wrong, I'll say I was distracted. <laughs> okay. All and right. Don't make me say that word I can't say, Arthur. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. <laughs> okay. Okay. Only sh uh, short words. So most of you, including James especially, know why you have a kidney number. For the most part, what does that kidney number mean? I'll give you multiple choice. It means if you got a kidney number that's abnormal, you better worry about dialysis or transplant. Nope, Wrong. not that one. If you got the kidney number that's abnormal, your kidney function is going to go down very quickly. Is nope, that nope, true? Nope, not that one. Not that for one. For the majority of people to know your kidney number is for the word that James can't pronounce. It's because you are at higher risk of you want to try it after uh, after <laughs> there you go i gotta get started doc after uh garotic arter atherosclerotic yeah everybody has heard the word atherosclerotic or hardening of the arteries right atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease if you have a real abnormal kidney number and especially if you also have protein in the urine, you are at risk, you are at higher risk of having an event related to hardening of the arteries, be it a stroke, be it a heart attack, and, and things like that. Uh, so for the most of you, you are not going to have to worry about going on dialysis. And we're going to dig into that a little more in a few minutes. Uh, so... James, what would be the commonest way that patients can see a cure of their kidney disease? Okay, James, you just came to me. And we no, wait, got wait, wait. What do you mean by cure? Okay, let me tell you. I'm going to just, it's a trick question. You come to me, I'm your doctor, and I get an abnormal kidney number. Your mm -hmm. EGFR is 45 or 50. What, let's, say it's, let's say it's 50, just for argument's sake. Yep. What's the what's the most likely cure that's going to happen to you? Trick question. So I'm going to guess that maybe I was dehydrated. It's a, it's a one abnormal one, and I drink some more water, get hydrated, and you test me again later, and it's normal. That okay. it could have been something as simple as that, or I was really really right. sick or something. I, I like I like that answer, James. And but what I'm going to say is repeating your lab value would be the number one way to be cured. Because I cannot tell you how many people go to their doctor, they get an abnormal EGFR, the kidney function number, and they panic. And they come back and get another one and it's normal. Okay, that's the first, okay? Well, they panic because they go on the internet and it's all doom and gloom. Absolutely, and it's doom and gloom and it's BS, big time BS. And the, and the okay. We're going to get into those testimonials of where people say, okay, someone like you, James, I'll give you a, make up a story. You came to see me. Your number was, was 50 or let's say 55. And I give you some woo woo. James, take my special kidney pill. Ooh. And James comes back a month later and it's 45 and he goes, or 40, whatever. It went from 55 to 45. And he goes, oh, that thing cured me nonsense it is absolute nonsense there are no such cures here's what happened let me break it down so if james came to me with a 50 on his kidney number that number is so inaccurate it's it's got a range of 10 to 30 percent in terms of what the real number is let me let's use 10 percent. if you came to me with the number of 50 the real number could be 50 plus 10%, which is 55, or 50 minus 10%, which could be 45. That would be the same number. And some of the repeated value research has shown that it can vary by as much as 30%. So that's why we need to not get a number and get a range or a, a degree or something. Values, repeated values, yeah. repeated values is the only thing that matters over months to a year and uh and so if, if 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 your number was 50 and the 
and the range was 30 percent that's that's you know 50 it's 35 uh, to 65 you got it that's right that, that's Anybody like a can. whole stage <laughs> practically so so don't get hung up on the one value okay and uh one of the things that someone suggested which i think is a good idea is look at your data points over a year and average them that's probably what your real that's probably the best example of your real number of your kidney function your egfr let me mention what egfr is james knows what it is right yes your estimated glomerular filtration rate which is just an right. estimation based on how much creatinine is in your blood and creatinine is not a bad thing of how well your kidneys are working. And, and the kidneys are a filter. Everybody knows that glomerular filtration is the filter, how fast, how well the kidneys filter. So let's go over some normal values. Now, if you're in the U S the normal value for a man, and this is going to vary by labs. And again, your result, if you go from one lab to the other, they may use a different method. They may use a different equation. So again, don't get hung up on those values because they can vary a lot. And but I want to I want to reinforce that I have within the same day had labs taken in the morning at the hospital, and then in the afternoon I'll get them again at my family doctor who sends them to a local lab, a different lab, two tests same day. And I had a four point difference between them. Wow. wow. And, and which was a, which is about a 10% difference. Yep. <laughs> if I look at percentages yep. of where it was. Yep. Yep. So normal creatinine, the numbers are, are low in the U S normal is like 0. 0.7 uh, to 1.3 for a man and 0. 0.6 to 1.1 for a woman. The reason why women are lower creatinine is muscle based. The more muscle you have, the more creatinine that you're going to have. Okay. And, uh, if you are in the rest of the world, you don't use the numbers that we use, which are milligrams per deciliter, your numbers, if you could divide your numbers basically, uh, by a hundred, right. Mm -hmm. Um, then you're going to get our number. Okay. So your numbers may be 62 to 115 which would be 0.62 to 1.1. So I know it's confusing, but I had to throw it out because we have people uh, are, are, are using data systems out that, that are not milligrams per deciliter or other parts of the world. It's micromoles per liter. Don't get hung up on those. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing to remember. These, uh, especially at low values, when you, when, so the, the formula for EGFR, puts a bunch of stuff in the formula to adjust for the fact that different age groups and males, females, and different race groups potentially may have different amounts of muscle mass. Okay. That's why they put stuff fudge factors in the equation to get your estimated glomerular filtration rate. But when your numbers are around that one range, it there's enormous variation. If it goes from one to 1.2, it could be an enormous difference. And so all of the values above 60, which would theoretically be stage one and two, stage one and two are values above 60. Kidney, CKD, stage one and two. A lot of labs decided, hey, that number is useless. We're going to throw it out. We're going to only say it's over 60. That's it. If it's over 60, they consider it normal. Except for what situations, James? You could be over 60 uh, and uh, and not be normal. You could so have it's stage not, one or two. It's not accurate for children. So I'm going to guess if you are diabetic, and that's a guess. No. If you, in addition to having that number. <sighs> have protein leakage. Have protein in the urine <laughs> or blood in the urine, you can have a kidney problem with an EGFR over 60, uh, if you have one of those two things, blood or protein in the urine, okay? Can't believe I forgot that. Oh. That's, fine. that's fine. So um, so just remember, the thing that's determining this equation, the creatinine, the thing that we all hear about, two things you hear about, a creatinine and EGFR. 
the creatinine is in the denominator. And, and if you think back to your high school math, if that number in the denominator gets larger, the result is a smaller number. If it gets smaller, it's a larger number, okay? Now, um, so what about protein? Let's talk about protein because just like you can get a repeat of your GFR number and be cured, it was a lab cure. <laughs> you can get a repeat of the a lab cure. I love that. And be cured. It's a love another lab cure because often urine protein at low levels, and this would be thirty in the U.S. or three in other countries, thirty milligrams per deciliter, or thirty milligrams per gram of creatinine. Um, you repeat it; it's going to be normal. And in general, I think if you have a urine analysis and you get a dipstick that's persistently one plus or two plus, you probably got kidney disease. You probably got protein in the urine. But there are some things, and we're gonna, we're gonna dig in a little bit about urine protein. There are some things that can give you urine protein and it's not gonna mean you got kidney disease per se. And I'm going to give you a few. Does, do you know anything that could do that? Uh, I'm going to guess some medications like diuretics. No, no, okay. no. Any that was a guess? guess. Okay. Urine, urinary tract infection. <sighs> if you are, especially in females, they often will have uh, bacteriouria and they may have white blood cells in urine. You can have protein. Does not mean you got kidney disease cure the infection, that protein can go away. Another way that you will see protein in the urine without being a kidney problem is people with heart failure. Very common, people with congestive heart failure are going to show some protein in the urine. Now I'm gonna get into something that you just said about your labs and your state of hydration, okay? Do not go out and drink gallons of water and people, I'm sure, have told you, hey, you want to get your creatinine down? Drink gallons and gallons of water and dilute it. It's I nonsense. hear that. I it's, see that in message boards. Anything. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. It has nothing to do with how the kidneys function. That creatinine is a marker, and it's a useful marker to get your kidney function number under a steady state. Not too overhydrated, not too underhydrated. The same goes for that dipstick protein. If you happen to have a real concentrated urine, and there's ways to uh, doctor to know that, something called specific gravity of the urine, we can know that, hey, that urine protein is three plus today, but it's real concentrated. So, so that, that can affect the protein in the urine. There is something I'll just touch on, and some of you may have kids that have protein in the urine, which is totally benign, does not mean anything in terms of their health, and it's called postural. They don't have protein when they're lying down in bed, but when they get up during the day and walk around, they can have protein in the urine. This is something that they found in recruits in the military. Now, some of these guys were having protein in the urine and they go, what the hey? And they found out if you examine the protein in the urine for the nighttime versus daytime, it's only daytime. It's postural of when you're upright, no, no, no real kidney issue. It's called orthostatic proteinuria. Okay. Just a, a something that if you, you may have heard, some of you may have actually heard about it. So here's a cure. One of the cures that we're going to talk a lot about, we've talked about today is you can get that protein down in the urine. And I would consider that, I don't know about a cure, but certainly an improvement. And the things that can decrease the protein in the urine are, James, what are Blood some pressure the medications, ACEs and ARBs. Yes, got it. Okay, good. What else? The ACE and ARB drugs are especially important if you got protein in the urine. What are the other things that can do it? I so badly want to say weight loss, but I can't the, remember if that's right. The drugs that, that we've been talking about. Oh, yes, the we SGLT2s. The new drugs that are designed for diabetics that are also going to be used for non-diabetics with protein in the urine. 
the SGLT2s, the GLP1s, these can also decrease protein in the urine. And in my mind, if you are on any of these drugs, and there's also drugs called aldosterone antagonists, this will be another session. If your protein goes down, it's not necessarily a cure, but it, it could be. It could be. It could, it could. So, for, for example, if you're a diabetic and we get that protein down in urine way, way down, we may slow your kidney decline down, and I would consider that a remission at least, okay? So getting the protein down in the urine could be almost a cure. Now, if we're going to talk about cures and woo-woos and what's important, we've got to mention the other factor that James and I have talked about repeatedly. What is a critical thing besides how the lab operates in terms of what your number means, what particular characteristic of the patient will determine whether that number is a serious problem or a normal value? Wait, that's a question for me? I don't know what the answer is you're looking for. The age. Oh. The age. So if you yes, are right. 75 years old and you happen to get an EGFR, that's that's around you know 50 or 60 and maybe even 45 or 50 that may well be normal for your age as long as you don't have protein in the urine so your egfr will vary by age you lose about one unit of gfr per year it's expected that you're going to have a lower egfr as you get older and the important thing is is not what your GFR is, it's whether or not it is stable or it's declining or improving. But um, for the most part, if you're an older folk and you've got one of these, let's say you're 70, 80, and you got a EGFR in the 45 to 60 range, you're probably going to be fine. Your kidney function will be stable over many, many years, assuming you don't have protein in the urine. Even decades. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. And studies have shown that. So um, the common way to see a cure is, of course, uh, what we just said, the repeat of the value. And I'm looking up. Um, let me go to my next page. Here. Sorry. Just All a right. quick reminder for you, Doc, when you turn the pages on yeah. your computer, yeah. it's extremely loud for all of us. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So as we said at the get-go, for most of you, knowing your kidney number is not so you can plan to get a kidney transplant or figure out where you're going to get your dialysis, especially if you're in stage three, uh, EGFR 30 to 60 or above. That's not your worry. Your worry is whether or not you're at risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you know, the heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. But the reason why if you are, you know, 60, 70, 80, and your GFR is 50, your risk of getting one of those cardiovascular events is no different than somebody that has a normal kidney number. So that's how we determine whether it's a significant issue. Now, James' most favorite topic, curing kidney disease by getting your creatinine down. <laughs> Yay, James, don't you want to get your creatinine? Doesn't everybody out there want to get your creatinine down? Isn't that the objective of anybody? Technically, <laughs> if I could and still be alive, <laughs> apparently that's what it cures kidney disease. Just remove all my muscle and I'll just be a blob on the bed and my kidneys will be great. <laughs> no. So let's talk about what is creatinine. Creatinine is not something that's harmful. Creatinine is not what causes you to be symptomatic from kidney disease. It is a marker that we use a convenient marker that we use to get your glomerular filtration rate. Where does it come from? It comes from what? Muscle. Your muscle moving, breathing, being alive, heartbeats. And what does it come from? A molecule called creatine, which you can buy. Has nothing to do with your kidneys. Don't buy creatine for your kidneys. Creatine has been, you know, proliferated for all kinds of health reasons, no benefits other than if you are a serious athlete, 
it may, I say may, improve your performance because creatine is metabolized to the energy producing molecule for your muscles to be strong, which is creatine phosphate. So no need to use creatine for your kidneys and a creatine is metabolized by, this is getting a little bit in the weeds, uh, an enzyme. And if you go to the, if God forbid you had a heart attack, there's an enzyme that we measure to see if muscles breaking down is called creatine kinase has nothing to do with kidneys has to do with muscle and your kidneys are filtering creatinine and creatine creatinine are not uremic or poisons or kidney poisons. They're just a marker to measure, you know, what your kidney function is. So if you lose muscle, you are going to produce less of this creatine and less creatinine. If you eat a diet with a lot of meat in it, you can get a higher creatinine. And if you eat a diet with a lot of protein, you can produce more creatinine. And what may happen to some of you who buy into these low protein diets that I am totally against, 100% against if you're diabetic, it's extremely dangerous because you can get hypoglycemia and die. And it's not recommended for anyone other than a young person losing kidney function very rapidly. But if you, by some chance, fall for this woo-woo and buy the keto supplements for the low protein diet, you may see what we talked about earlier, some of these testimonials, which you'll see in many of these products. Oh, I went from 50 to 40, okay? And again, a lot of this can be just noise in the lab data, the variation in the lab data, but also you may be producing less creatinine on a, on a lower protein diet. So it may just have to do with the amount of creatinine produced, nothing to do with whether your kidneys have actually improved or not. Um, so, uh, so things that can raise creatinine are extreme exercise, um, uh, you know, and muscle breakdown, there are some drugs that can raise your creatinine, uh, just a handful like cimetidine they use for ulcers, famotidine. Some of you may be on that. So that can falsely raise your creatinine. Again, if you raise your creatinine, it's the number in the denominator, you lower your GFR, uh, trimethoprim sometimes used to treat urinary tract infections. That can also cause uh, a higher creatinine. So these, and, and when those medications increase the creatinine in your blood, I'm assuming it's just temporary while temporary. you're taking it. Yep. Stop it. It goes away. And uh, and there is a way to do kidney function. It's more expensive. It doesn't involve muscle. Doesn't involve the creatinine. Doesn't, you don't have to worry about your muscle mass and whether you wasted away, you're malnourished and this and that, which can affect that value. It's called cystatin. And some of you may have heard it. It's another way to measure your kidney function. And I'll say something that those of you who are, again, faced with decision about dialysis or transplant, which we talk about in the book, if, you're, if there's concern about what your real kidney function number is. And don't go by one number. Don't let your doctor start your dialysis for one number. And if there's a question about whether I, I've lost a lot of muscle, I mean, is that affecting what my kidney function number is? Uh, if, 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 if there's things going on in your diet and things that you're not sure about what the real number is, you can do 24 hour urine to do a kidney function number. And the book goes into that and you could talk to your doctor about getting those values. That's a, that's a measured as opposed to an estimated kidney function number. So I'll tell you, I did one of those. It would yeah. be much easier to do it today with COVID because mm -hmm. we're all working remote. I was at work and did it. Yeah. And that's you're collecting good. all your urine for 24 hours. Yeah, it could, it could be a lot of jugs filling up your refrigerator. Not everybody's going to be happy with that. <laughs> yeah. 
And again, don't be fooled by the internet cures. Please don't fall for any of those things that they're trying to sell you. And again, uh, the things that have nothing to do with kidneys that can affect creatinine, a lot of exercise, the cooked meat, a lot of eating lots of meat, your state of hydration is extremely important. And, um, and the thing that we need to go into, uh, James already alluded to it, is the thing that can result in a change of kidney function that's temporary, presumably curable, then you could be cured, is something called acute renal failure. And again, anytime you're getting your kidney function measured, you need to not be changing your diet, you need to not be changing your state of hydration, you're hopefully using the same laboratory uh, that will give you more reliability of the repeated values. But even with that, remember, any value can be off by 10 to 30%. So don't get scared with any one value. So um, what about the cure by the reversible declines of kidney function? What is the number one uh, reason for the reversible declines, James? Well, I'm going to guess it's you were dehydrated, so you got properly hydrated. And I think for me, a lot of it was getting my blood pressure under control because mine was just out of control when I was in kidney failure. Right. Well, okay. So the commonest reason for people to show a drop in their EGFR, let's say you've been walking around with the 50 or 60 and you go to the doctor and it's 20 or 30. One of the commonest reasons is that you got dehydrated. You had a flu. You weren't eating well. You had diarrhea. You had vomiting. The commonest reason. Hydrate you up. You're back to normal. You're cured. You're cured. Okay. I wish and, it was that easy. Oh, I do. <laughs> what's that? I wish it was that easy for all of us. <laughs> right. Right. But, but, but understand that there is such a thing as a temporary decline in kidney function which is the main way that people may be showing these cures. You know, it may not have anything to do with anything they've, you've been given. It may be just that you have corrected a dehydration. Other things that can temporarily drop your kidney function are when you first start on blood pressure medicine. If you're one of these folks that has a 180 real high blood pressure, you get it down to a good range, your kidney may not be happy temporarily and it, and it may drop your EGFR. And again, the drugs that can decrease protein in the urine, slow the decline of kidney function, commonly do what, James? They cause an initial watch to your kidney function. I am so sorry. I was answering somebody, but I'm going okay. to guess uh, that it's dropped, but I don't know what right. you asked. Right. So, so when you take these drugs that in the long term can slow decline of kidney function, like an ACE, which would be something like captopril, those are the pearls, or an ARB, which would be something like losartan, the drugs that end in tan, or the GLP-1s, or the SGLT-2s. All of these drugs that not only decrease the protein in the urine, but can slow decline of kidney function they all may produce an initial decline in your kidney function. To be aware of that, not a reason to necessarily stop the drugs. And what are the common drugs that lots of your viewers take that could, especially if they're dehydrated, also drop your kidney function? Besides the ACEs, ARBs, and SGLT2s, and the GLP1s. Which ones? The, oh my goodness, it slipped my mind. The water pills, the... Um... Diuretics is right. Diuretics. <laughs> diuretics. If somebody is over diuresed, that can uh, raise the creatinine by concentrating it. And again, if you raise the creatinine, you lower the GFR. But a, a, um, a more common one are the NSAIDs. Lots of us take the Motrim, mm -hmm. the Aleves, and stuff like that to treat our aches and pains. The Advil, the Naproxen, the Ibuprofen. That those are common drugs that if you're taking them and you get dehydrated, commonly can affect your kidney 
will drop, can temporarily drop it. Stop the drugs, it'll get better. The other real common situation, those of you who have had heart trouble, if your heart gets weaker, commonly your kidneys will not be working as good. So that's another reversible situation. Your heart gets weaker, your kidney function gets worse, and guess what? It's been shown that, and this is something you may need to tell your doctor about, and it's, I discussed this some in my book. If you got heart failure, a lot of doctors are afraid to dye your issue to get the fluid off you. But the research has shown that with the heart failure, getting that fluid off to help you breathe is going to probably allow you to live longer, even if your kidney function temporarily goes down. But it's it's not because the kidneys got worse. It's because your your heart is is what the problem is. Um, things that can cause reversible in men. Men get large prostates that can block the bladder, okay? Kidney stones, if, if it's both sides of the kidney block, you can get a reversible uh, kidney problem. Uh, but the commonest ones are diarrhea and vomiting from flus and over diuresis if somebody is taking too much of a diuretic. Um, and um, I'll, I'll just touch on, I think it's important. I, I mentioned the NSAIDs. Um, if you're con and you could use them briefly. If you you want to use them, they're good anti-inflammatory drugs for your arthritis. Don't use them long term. Short term is fine because if you're using them long term, they can mess with your kidneys, uh, and it can also mess with your GI tract. Okay, and uh, so there's certain drugs that um, may be easier on your GI tract. Uh, like Celebrex, but all of these drugs taken long term can potentially have bad effects on your heart. So you don't want to take any of these long term. They can cause bleeding, they can worsen kidney function, and they can have an effect, bad effect on your heart. Short term, it's okay. Um, so we're going to wind this up in a little bit and get your questions after the folks out there. But um, the so-called cures, in my estimation, are they're woo-woo, they're not real cures. These testimonials are not real cures. Most of it is variation in lab results. Uh, a lot of it could be variation in state of hydration. Uh, and there's no evidence for those of you who get online and want the cure for your kidney about herbs, absolutely no evidence that they do anything beneficial for your kidneys. And there is evidence that aristocolic acid, something used in Chinese herbal medicine, will cause kidney failure. And some of these herbs may have other metals in them that could be unhealthy. The natural methods, the Ayurvedic medicine, I'm all for holistic medicine. I'm all for people who want to meditate. I'm all for treating the entire body. But there are treatments available for kidney disease. And the treatments that are available, I mentioned in my book, these other things, there's no science that proves that these things are going to benefit you. No science for the microbiome. You know, any of the things that people want to take to change their microbiome. No science that it helps your kidneys. There's no kidney disease solution that some of the people advertise on the internet. There's no kidney repair pill. Those are nonsense. They are absolutely nonsense. And what all about kidney that, restores and kidney flushes. All nonsense, all nonsense. Stay away from them. No benefit and potential harm. And anytime you see somebody trying to tell you, oh, I'm going to give you the method to lower your creatinine to cure your kidney disease. As we've said, and I hope you understand it, that doesn't do anything for your kidney disease by artificially trying to lower your creatinine. Uh, there are no foods that are going to heal your kidneys. There are foods, and I am very much in favor of a plant-based diet, and, and plant-based diet and the things that James talked about when we started the show, the lifestyle things that you can do mm -hmm. to decrease your risk of heart attacks and strokes, 
the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease <laughs> problems. I'll uh, practice it. I'll get it one day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, plant-based diet is beneficial. Eating more fiber is beneficial. And those diets will be relatively low in protein, not extremely low in protein. And that may also be beneficial to slow the decline of kidney function. And I think there's good news on the horizon for all of you with kidney disease. There are studies continuing to come out every day on these drugs that we just mentioned, that there's another doctor on the show that, that James had out here to talk about some of these drugs. I'm gonna to talk to you more and more about them. They hopefully will become more readily available for diabetics and non-diabetics to help you live longer and slow decline of kidney function and keep people that are at risk. There are some people that are at risk, especially those that have high levels of urine protein, those folks that are at risk to, to markedly decrease the likelihood that they're ever gonna need dialysis. So you've got, you've got some good stuff in the future for you folks with kidney disease. So I guess right. we got some time, James. To answer and some I got questions. a question for you. Oh, we got a lot of time tonight. We're going to be able to get to a lot of questions. But I have one for you. I'm going to tee it up for you because I know the answer. We talked about how um, an AKI, an acute kidney injury, a temporary drop in your, your kidney function can appear as a cure. Is it possible for someone to have both CKD and an AKI? Good question. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very important issue. And in my career, I've had people that have had recurrent episodes. I'll give you, I'll make up an example. Let's say you, your EGFR has been hanging in around 40 and, and you get an AKI, either you get dehydrated, you drop your blood pressure, you have a flu, uh, it drops down to 20. We get you back to your baseline to 40. We give you fluids. You know, we take away the drugs. We take away the Motrin. We take away the things that are hurting your kidneys. We may have to temporarily stop the ACE or the ARB, you know, to, to make sure that we get your kidneys back to where they were. The question that's been around for a long time is whether or not these episodes of AKI increase your probability of ever going on dialysis and they might the jury's not fully out but but it certainly is possible and it's not only possible it's very common uh as you get uh the ckd4 egfr is below 30 you're much more prone to get a ch significant change of your kidney function with some dehydration or one of these medicines like an ace an r or an NSAID. so that's a good question yeah, and I believe that's what I had. Um, I ate at a restaurant before my, you know, my episode, and I got very sick shortly after eating. I think, you know, don't know for sure, but I believe the meal wasn't safe. There was some food poisoning, and I got dehydrated, and I had no clue that I had any kidney issues. But I believe that right there is what pushed me over the line and then it just kind of snowballed from there and once i was in the icu i got hydrated i i was i couldn't keep anything down for like two weeks there i was definitely dehydrated um low on a lot of stuff like potassium and things like that in the beginning i think once they got that under control that accounted for in addition to my lifestyle changes my regaining or recovery is probably the better word of my kidney function, at least, you know, a, a part of it. Gotcha. And, and the thing to remember, any of you out there who have CKD, uh, you are more susceptible to get uh, these declines of kidney function if you have multiple things going on, like you're dehydrated and you're taking Motrin and um, you're taking an ACE or an ARB, you know, I mean, and maybe you get an x-ray contrast. X-ray contrast can also knock your kidneys down. So it's common for people to have multiple, or, and, you, and your blood pressure gets a little lower. So 
But people who have these temporary declines, there's often many things feeding into it. And my, again, my advice, and it's in the book, is do not allow your doctor to put you on dialysis lifelong just because you've got one of those changes, like you went from 30 to 10, which is not uncommon. You had a 30 EGFR, you got dehydrated, you were vomiting, you had diarrhea, you had fever, you dropped your blood pressure, you had a heart failure episode, it went down to 10. Don't let your doctor put you on uh, unless it's an emergency, and, and it's very rarely an emergency, without giving you an opportunity to see if those kidneys recover. Very crucial thing, which unfortunately I've seen many patients get put on with acute renal failure and, and no one looks back to see if, if the patient had recovered. That's, in my estimation, bad practice, but it happens. <clears throat> All right. So do you have the questions over on your side or do you see the comments, Doc? And we okay. got so many people. I want to I want to ask everyone, please give the video a thumbs up. There are hundreds of hundreds of people on here live right now. And if all of you just click that little thumbs up, boom, that will help a lot. Okay. Um, uh Yeah, I think Ronnie, I don't know if uh, I may have answered this before, but Ronnie is on a GLP-1. I don't know how to pronounce it. Far F-A-R-X-I-G-A. -A. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the EGFR went down. And, you know, uh, Ronnie, I, as I said, um, these drugs are new. Uh, and, and honestly, I am not practicing. So it's not like I'm going to get a ton of experience. But your endocrinologist, your nephrologist, will be getting more and more experience over time. But you get then there's lots of education going around for patients and for the doctors. But you can expect an initial decline. And especially if you've got a reason to be on it, the main reasons would be protein in the urine, or you've got a, a cardiac problem, you've had a heart attack or stroke, or you've got uh, some kind of heart disease. Um, then it's probably worth continuing to see how the pattern of your kidney function goes. Can you talk a little bit about what is normal blood pressure, where we should be targeting? There's a number of questions around that. The normal blood pressure uh, as a result of a major study that came out in 2017, all of the various associations, the kidney, the heart, um, the endocrine, we all have changed the guidelines and we've moved the blood pressure goal to 120 and even 110 except in diabetics because the research on aggressive control of blood pressure in diabetics showed that some diabetics may have had some potential bad outcomes when they went below 130. my advice is as long as you can monitor your blood pressure i think all of you should shoot for a goal blood pressure of 110 to 120, assuming you're not getting symptoms and assuming that your kidneys are happy with it because that can protect your kidneys and protect you from the atherosclerotic complications, the strokes, the heart attacks, uh, the chest pain, uh, the bad blood vessel problems. Uh, I, I, I lost you, James. Oops, I had my mute still on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still recovering from my cold, and I don't want everyone hearing me sniffing. Jane and Bill ask, can alcohol cause higher serum creatinine and consequently lower your estimated GFR? Well, okay. First of all, alcohol is not going to affect your creatinine, but I will tell you one interesting story, which is common, which I've seen in my practice. If somebody's drinking a lot and they just fall asleep with their arm resting somewhere and the arm falls asleep and they don't move it like for a day, muscle in the arm can break down. When the muscle breaks down, that breakdown of muscle can affect the kidneys. And that can cause, believe it or not, uh, muscle breakdown, kidney failure. So indirectly, if somebody's really drunk, they could get muscle breakdown, kidney failure. The most important thing that uh, alcohol does is it raises blood pressure. 
If you're an alcoholic, you're drinking a lot of alcohol, that will make your blood pressure control a, a lot harder. I'm reading something interesting. Two weeks ago, I had some other issues among countless tests for kidney testing. And now I am well with normal range. And no Unless Mr. Bob, to... let me tell you, he doesn't believe we're live. Mr. Bob, see, it's live. <laughs> I mean, that is a great example of what we've been talking about tonight. Don't panic over one value. Mm -hmm. Get your values over a year. Get your values over several years to see where you're going and to see where your concerns are in terms of your urine protein values and your kidney number. Uh, uh, yeah, so CKD is not a nail in your coffin by any stretch. Yeah. Uh, Even if the uh, internet makes it sound like it, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, if you go on the internet, it's like the incurable kidney disease. <laughs> Most of the kidney disease is not real disease. It's just an abnormal lab test, which gives you a higher risk of like what we talked about, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's the folks that get down to maybe 30 or less, and they've got high levels of protein. Then we start thinking about the, the potential to progress. The, the vast majority of you with CKD are much, much earlier stage without very much uh, protein. And here's a quick uh, question for Rebecca. Can yeah. stress cause any impact on your kidney function? I would say that uh, your mental health affects every part of your body. I am, I am one of these people that fully believe in mind body interaction. Now specifically, uh, it's not a direct that I can think of, uh, emotional effect on your kidneys. But if you're, if you're out of whack and your blood pressure goes up, that will certainly potentially have an effect on your kidney. If you're not eating well, that could have, or drinking adequate, that could have an effect on your kidney. But by and large, emotional issues don't have much uh, to do with the kidney. And, um, and John asked, can ultrasounds show abnormalities with your kidneys? Absolutely. An ultrasound is basically what it says, it's sound waves, they're bouncing sound waves off your kidneys. And today's ultrasounds, I remember when I had my first kids, uh, they were pretty rough. You know, you try to determine the sex on the ultrasound, but now they're great. I mean, you got 3D ultrasounds. They're very, very, anyway, ultrasounds will tell you the size of your kidneys, which is critical because people who don't, you may go to your doctor and your EGFR is 30 or 40. How long have I had to stop? Well, let me see how big my, your kidneys are. If your kidneys are small, it's likely we've had it for a while. The other thing that ultrasound could tell is if you've got blockage, it'll show something called hydronephrosis, dilation of the collecting system uh, inside uh, the kidney. Let me answer Kelly's thing. Kelly said, best thing I did is get my blood pressure under control under 150 to 100 down to 98 over 70, stop drinking alcohol and keep sodium to 1800. <clears throat> Kelly, I am happy that you are on a low salt diet. I am not happy to see you at 98 over 70. Now, um, there are people that without medicines run a systolic of around that 100. Uh, you're, if you're treating yourself or your, do your doctor's treating you and treating you down to 100 or less, that may be a little bit low and you may or may not be symptomatic. So, you know, Low is okay, but not too low. You want to stay within a range of, let's say, 110 to 130. I'd be a little concerned about 98 if that's the, uh, if that's the most of your blood pressure. And especially if it's 98 and you're getting ready to take your medicine, it may drop down to 70, and that's no good. So if it's that low, re don't, take, don't take your pill that, at that night. Let's say it's, you're taking it at night. And you just checked it and it was 95. I would hold it until the next morning and make sure you back up to 110, 120. Because too low a blood pressure can give you chest pain, decreased blood flow to your heart, can give you a heart attack, can give you decreased blood flow to your brain, can give you a stroke, can give you decreased blood flow to your kidneys, can make your kidney function worse. So 
yeah, you, you've got to be aware that, and that's one of the reasons why there was some pushback about, um, you know, the, the low goal for blood pressure. As long as you do home monitoring and you monitor, especially if you're symptomatic, you're going to be fine and you will have long-term benefits for a goal of blood pressure 110 and 120. Now, Mark did a $10 donation. Thank you very much, Mark. Greatly appreciate it. And he says, Aloha, Doc. He's in Hawaii. I'm familiar with um, I'm familiar with the rule of protein intake using the eight factor with weight. Can I have a higher intake of protein since I'm lifting weights and burning protein in repairing muscle? Yeah, I'm listen, I am fine with um look in general uh the diet for people with ckd the recommendation is is around uh you know 60 to 80 gram protein diet uh our normal protein diet is about 120 to 150. now um you know i i don't think that that there's good evidence that you're going to necessarily worsen your kidney function by being on a high protein diet. I would, I would try to limit it to somewhere between 60 and 80, because I think that's the sweet spot for not too high because high protein has been shown to damage kidneys. Okay. Low protein is not proven, <clears throat> especially very low protein that it will preserve kidney function. So I would go in the sweet spot somewhere between 60 to 100 and, and, not, and not be um, going up much higher than that. Because there is a possibility that a high-protein diet will adversely affect your kidney. Now, we're almost at the top of the hour, so I'm going to give you a moment to uh, find another question to answer. And I'm going to show everyone your book. If they want to learn more about the things you're talking about, Learn the facts about kidney disease is Dr. Rowe's amazing book. You can get it at your local bookstores. You can get it at Amazon. There's a link right there. Go to slash book, which will take you to Amazon to that book. It makes understanding kidney disease so much easier. And it gets rid of a lot of the worry that new kidney patients have, especially after going on the internet. I'll try to answer a few. Prednisone, Olivia is used for certain types of glomerular diseases. There's rare diseases that cause protein in the urine, and some of them are treated with uh, prednisone, and they can help the, uh, certain types of diseases, but they are, that's a long discussion, and your, your kidney doctor would have to have a biopsy to see if it's one of them that responds to prednisone. Blood work markers for CHF, yeah, there certainly are uh, markers uh, for CHF. But the main way is a echocardiogram to check the ejection fraction. The echocardiogram will see what percentage of the blood in your, in, your, in your left ventricle is squeezed out. That's called the ejection fraction. That's the best measure. Uh, in terms of meat, I'd say decreased red meat, uh, lean uh, meat without skin is okay. In terms of your diet, try to eat plant-based as much as possible. <clears throat> um, uh, and, um, do, 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 do. uh, I'm vegetarian and from it's proteinary. Okay. So vegetarian, 130 pounds, normal blood pressure, vitamins, minerals, sodium bicarbonate, proteinuria, and iron. How do I get this down? Well, <clears throat> look, um, if you've got protein in the urine, you should probably be on an ACE or an ARB uh, as a blood pressure treatment. And if you're diabetic and you got protein, and again, when you say proteinuria, it's, you need to know the quantity of protein. Uh, but you would probably, your doctor may want to consider the SGLT2 or GLP1 if you got significant. As far as naturally decreasing proteinuria, there is no such thing. You may... There is some potential data on low carb diet, uh, plant based diets, um, maybe having some decrease in proteinuria, but but it's not not a definitive finding. 
Um, and uh, what about the more realistic GFR below 40? The good doctor uses higher numbers. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, 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 Rex, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the majority of people, 90% of the people are stage three. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will have another show talking about stage four and five. Uh, and there are definitely things that, that are applicable to folks in, in that range that are not in, in the stage three folks. Um, and uh, as far as Kelly Davis, I had microalbuminuria. Uh, so again, 60 to 25. This may be like your variation in blood pressure numbers. That's a pretty low number. And, and, um, and I don't think keeping uh, your protein one down, I think it's reasonable to have a, a low protein diet, but I don't know that your low, low protein diet has much to do with that microalbuminuria. That would be my interpretation. Um, are we almost at the end there, James? I don't want to go over. We overdo are it. at the end. <laughs> okay, okay. So many questions. All right, sorry, sorry, folks. Sorry. But yeah, I will. Um, uh, someone here is, is uh, I, I am 68 years of our 28 going for a transplant. Uh, Betty, uh, read my book. That sounds a little bit early to be thinking about transplant at 28. It sounds way too early. Yeah. But I need to know more about her. All right, Doc. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have a great audience. So many people on right now. Please give the video a thumbs up. It helps other kidney warriors find all this information, this video and all the other videos that we've created, helping educate you about kidney disease, helping you live a better life while you happen to have kidney disease. This is my last scheduled show for the week. I will be back next weekend and I might even do a little uh, member subscriber hangout this Saturday like I did back in January where we just jump on here and get to chat with each other and say hi because we're all like a big giant family here. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And remember, Dr. Rose book, Excellent, excellent, excellent book. Learn the facts about kidney disease. If I was a doctor, I would hand every new patient this book so that they did not go home, get on Dr. Google or Nurse Facebook and get scared to death. What you need to know is in there. And let me tell you, it makes it so much easier to know what you need to focus on and when you might need to get more serious and it helps alleviate so much worry that so many people have unnecessarily. All right, everybody, thank you so much, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone.